But welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're here at 631. And um, I just want to uh, uh, say how really honored I am that uh, Bishop Mark Eddington has made time in his schedule and uh, please be nice to him. Um, he uh, is in Paris and it is currently six hours ahead of us. So that makes it uh, by my clock 1230 uh, on, on Tuesday. Um, he's uh, ahead of, uh, as always, Mark is generally ahead of people. So he's, he's just literally time-wise ahead of us a little now. Um, Mark and I uh, are friends in the House of Bishop. Um, he is in Providence too. And, and, um, and I've really been grateful for the opportunity to minister with him um, in that capacity. Um, he uh, is the second bishop of the, Episcopal, of the Episcopal Convocation of Europe. And uh, I had the privilege of going in March of 2019 because of my role as, um, um, and with the province, uh, being the president of the province now, uh, to be there in Paris. And I will say um, it was really a beautiful uh, time. Um, he uh, has worked uh, as a priest and he's got a quite a, a, a amazing background. Um, including serving as the first Epps Fellow and Chaplain to Harvard College uh, in the Memorial Church of Harvard University. Um, he has uh, uh, also uh, been an officer and director of a number of nonprofit organizations since 2014. He was a trustee of the Adrian College in Adrian, Michigan, where he sits on the Academic Affairs and Strategic Planning Committee. From 2013 to 2016, he served um, as director of the Harvard University Employees Credit Union, where his work encompassed service on the institution's credit, uh, excuse me, audit committees. Um, he um, is a founding, one of the founding board of three NGOs and is a de -com deep commitment to civic engagement with foreign policy and inter interfaith engagement in both dialogue and service. And in 2018, he uh, authored and published a book, Bivocational, Returning to the Roots of Ministry, a church publishing uh, book that I'm hoping that you've gotten a copy of and that you read. Um, Mark, I'm really grateful for your time with us and for your generosity um, and your wisdom. And so welcome. And I think, oh. Jill, you're, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dee Dee. I really appreciate that introduction. And um, you all should know that Bishop Dee Dee has been a, a friend to me uh, as I've begun in this ministry. And it's true, she came all the way over here uh, just to just to have a, a speaking part in my consecration. And I, I will always appreciate you for doing that. So, so welcome everybody and uh, greetings from your church in Europe. Greetings from your brothers and sisters here in the 21 congregations of the Convocation of Episcopal Churches. We are, um, I think by geography, we have a pretty good claim to be the biggest um, piece of territory in the Episcopal Church. We stretch from Paris in the west to Tbilisi in the east in Georgia, not, not the one not next to Florida, but the other one. Um, and we probably have <clears throat> the oldest building consecrated for Christian worship in the whole Episcopal Church. And I I make that claim um, pretty confidently because it was built in the 11th century and it's in Santa Maria a Ferrano in Italy. So it's a great and interesting place with incredibly dedicated people. And we hope that you will come and visit us sometime. Um, come and do a pilgrimage, come and visit us in our churches and, and just see what your church is like in a place that isn't the United States. So um, I have a little, program to offer you this evening. Um, as some of you know, um, during COVID time, I pulled together a little book uh, on kind of what, what is this going to mean for us and what are the questions that we'll have to answer as we come out of this time. Um, so what I'd like to do is tell you the story of how this book came to be and what I learned putting it together, sort of what was the process that was, that sort of animated how the book came into being? Um, what were the lessons for me? Um, and then I wanna set some work for you because this book 
um, quite literally appeared a year ago now, exactly. It, it sort of hit the presses a year ago and had been in development obviously for some time ahead of that. And you know we've learned a lot in the years since this book appeared. So I, I can imagine some things that I would have done differently or some themes that I might have emphasized or looked for people to write about I'm going to share one of those things with you in the talk I'm going to give. One of the things that I, I, I wish I had seen a little more clearly, and I now think is a pretty significant um, kind of challenge for us here, at least in Europe, coming out of the pandemic. And then um, I'm actually going to ask you to sort of join with me in the work of imagining, well, how might we how might we extend this book? <laughs> how might we rewrite it or at least um, revise it to be a little more updated based on what we've learned in this last year? So I'll do that and then we'll take a break and I'll take any questions that have arisen um, that you wanna ask me or, or sort of questions you wanna pose. Um, and once we've done that, we're gonna pitch into small groups. and. Um, we're going to have two tasks for breakout groups to, to manage. They're going to take about 20 to 25 minutes each time you gather uh, to answer some questions. And then at the end, we'll get back together for a wrap up session. So first thing I want to do is just ask permission to proceed in that manner. Does that seem like a good way to roll? I see some thumbs up. Great. OK, well, thank you for that, because uh, at this hour, it's a little bit too late to change the slides I got, folks. So, all right, what I'd like to do now is share with you a screen. Oh, but the host has disabled screen sharing. Oh dear, will somebody allow me to share my screen? Maybe Jill, that would be you. I'm trying, I think it might be Kathy. <laughs> Kathy. This is going to be a much shorter <laughs> evening for everybody than you oh. knew. <laughs> there. There you go. There Michelle. we go. Thank you, ma'am. Now I'm with you. Okay. All right. So I hope that you can all see this. Got it? We're good. We're good. All right. So if you're if you're seeing me in the little tiny thumbnail on your screen, you're going to notice that I'm. It looks like I'm not paying attention to you, and that's because the slides that I'm looking at on our different screen over here. So please don't feel bad about that. But um, so I'd like to tell you how this all started. Um, Bishop Didi and I are in the practice of seeing each other at least twice a year, and those times are in March and September. That's when the House of Bishops meets. And in 2020, uh, gosh, a year and a half ago now, oh, I oh was expecting to come back to the United States for the March House of Bishops meeting. And um, at a pretty late moment, maybe I guess it was a couple of weeks before the meeting, we got a message from the presiding bishop saying, um, hey folks, we're hearing this funny thing about this disease and we don't really know what it means. And we just think we're gonna do this meeting you know, remotely on Zoom. Because uh, out of an abundance of caution, remember that phrase. Uh, we're we're just gonna we're just gonna do it on Zoom. And I thought, you know, I have a lot of meetings that I've scheduled around this time, because my chances to come back to the United States are always opportunities for me to meet with my colleagues. Uh, Tom Brackett's on this call, and I, I get chances to meet with Tom, and um, I look forward to those times. So I'm I'm just gonna go, and uh, I'll do the Zoom call from home, maybe, but. Um, I'm just going to go and try to make all those meetings happen. Well, as you might expect, none of those things happened. And instead, what happened was this. I was sitting uh, at home on March 16th of 2020, listening to President Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, announced that the very next day the borders were going to close. And my ticket back to Paris was for March 20th. <laughs> So I had a problem, which was that I couldn't get back to where I was supposed to be. <clears throat> and I tried to get a ticket uh, for the very next day, but alas, uh, they were not affordable for me. And so I wound up being stuck in Massachusetts for about two months while everything was locked down and nobody was moving. And that's not a happy place to be. So um, 
what do you do? Well, as a younger man, I learned how to fly airplanes. And one of the things that's taught to you, if that's the thing that you learn to do is whenever you get into trouble, always, always, always have the discipline of checking the manual because the manual is the accumulated wisdom of everybody else who's ever made a mistake in that airplane and figured out the answer. Here's a picture of the flight manual of Apollo 13. And this is the page at the moment at which that explosion happened that led to the infamous phrase, Houston, we have a problem. So you can see they checked the manual and they started making notes and there's an X there that said, well, we're not gonna do that because something bad happened. So that's what I did. I got out the profile. That's the manual for me, the profile that was published by the good people of the convocation when they were searching for a new bishop. And I read it from end to end again, looking for the section that was gonna tell me what to do in a pandemic. And folks, this was not in the manual. So I had to do something else. And instead, what I did was I decided to ask a lot of smart people, people who were wiser than me and who had more experience of our church, more experience of this ministry, more experience of seeing the church through difficult times of different kinds, what they were thinking about this very strange and disorienting moment. So I'm fortunate that I'm blessed with many friendships in the academy and in our church and outside the Episcopal church, people who are thinkers and thought leaders um, in different parts of the challenges our church faces going into the future. And I just began to talk with them in telephone calls, and then finally asked them to write essays for me saying, you know, what do you think is going to happen? None of us could possibly know what the answer would then be to the question, what is this all going to do to us? What will the future be for us? But these people were smart enough to know what the questions would be. They were wise enough to understand what were the challenges that this was going to give us what were the questions that we were gonna to have to answer as we lived through this time and then came out on the other side? Now, remember, I was commissioning these essays in about May of 2020. Think about how long ago that was in COVID time, how much things have changed and how much, things, how much we have learned in that time. But as I gathered these essays, and there's about 20 of them in all, what I found was my colleagues as they wrote about these questions, their responses gathered themselves into themes. I didn't really have to do that for them. I didn't have to suggest this for them. They just naturally began to identify some common themes, some common questions that they thought our church would have to confront as we live through this and live beyond this time of pandemic. So, in what follows, I'm gonna tell you what those five themes were, and they're the organizing structure of the book itself. The essays are gathered in those themes. And I gave the folks an opportunity to read each other's essays to, to tighten their own thinking before they, they sort of put their final version forward to me. The first of those themes was distancing and deepening. What does that mean? Well, it means that at one and the same time, what was happening to us was we were being distanced from each other, right? We weren't gathering together in churches anymore. We were all at home behind the glow of our screens. And we were finding ourselves in this place where our experience of faith, our experience of church was oddly deepening because almost we were, because we were aware of missing it. We were putting more of our conscious energy into engaging with it. More people were saying the morning prayer office every day. More people were actually making a plan to be connected to their friends in church on Zoom. So the questions that emerged were, how could we turn this time of distancing into a time of deeper spirituality? And how might we keep that deeper conversation with God in the regathered church on the other side of this? How can we how can we keep that more, more open sense to, of God's presence and God's call in our life when we come through the other side of this? 
And a related question to this was, how might the virtual, this thing that's been so new to us, how might that virtual church inform or be the future of our church? I think we know now that actually the question is, how might the hybrid church be our future? We're not in an either or situation, but how is that going to look for us? Greg Garrett is a professor of English at Baylor University. He's a scholar of race and culture and just one of the wisest people I know. He's also canon theologian of our cathedral here in Paris. And here's a little quote from, from what he wrote. I've had to remind myself that we discern in community and that being alone in my own head was bad for me emotionally and spiritually. So that's what pushed Greg over the edge of finally getting engaged in Zoom church. And he was showing up, even though he lives in Texas, regularly in the Zoom calls for the cathedral. So distancing and deepening, that the sort of interestingly opposed thing that we were farther apart from each other, but deepening in our own experience of faith was a question of how do we keep that in the future? Second question, liturgy and longing. So what did we learn from having to shift into this virtual world, from having to create new ways of worship. What did we learn from all that about the kind of worship we have been doing? Well, one of the things we learned about it is we love it, right? We, we missed it, but we also might've seen it in a new way. We might've begun asking ourselves questions about, is this really helping us get to the future? Or is it something that's just very comfortable about things we remember from the past, what is this sort of challenge setting ahead of us about the worship that we need to offer to a changed world? Are there ideas or themes that we should be careful not to lose as we move out of the pandemic and back into a thing that feels a little more familiar? Andrew McGowan is the Dean and President of Berkeley School of Divinity at Yale. And, you know, at just the moment we were commissioning these essays, we were wondering about what is virtual Eucharist? Is that a possibility even? And I think the church has come to the mind that actually, no, that's probably not a very good idea. Andrew wrote this, just as there are things only an incarnate savior can do, so too there are things that only the Eucharist will bring us. I happen to think that's probably right, but at the same time, I know that we can do all kinds of new things and engage all kinds of new people because we open the doors and windows of virtual connection and virtual worship into the church when that was the only alternative we had. So the question for us is how do we keep the lessons that we learned about worship together? And what does that mean for the kind of liturgy we'll do in the future? Third question, hard choices and helping hands. What's that mean? Well. What questions about financial structures and stability will emerge from this time of isolation to confront parishes and judicatories? Judicatories are you know, dioceses or larger structures. And is self-help the only option? What, what do I mean by that? Well, self-help is pretty much the ethos of the Episcopal church, or at least of, 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 our, of our country. It basically says that you're on your own. It basically says that, you know, your, your church sort of stands or falls on the basis of the contributions that you are able to receive from your people and on the endowment given by generations past. But it's up to you. It's up to each individual congregation. We're not really good at thinking collectively about the health of the church. And it's not the case, typically, that we see the richer parishes helping the poorer parishes. That's kind of what diocese tries to do. But we, we are a church that has been revealed to have some pretty significant inequalities. That's one of the things that this time of COVID showed us. I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a moment. Elise Erickson Barrett is a woman who works for um, the Lilly Foundation. In particular, she works for um, a part of the foundation that focuses on financial and economic sustainability in parish life in the United States. And this is a quote of hers that I think about all the time. 
the COVID-19 crisis has acted as a force accelerant, turbocharging existing financial and demographic trajectories by a decade or more. That feels very true in our European context here. Things that we knew were true, we knew that uh, elder folks are having a harder and harder time just getting to church and feeling safe doing it. We knew that young families with children are having a harder and harder time making the time for church on Sunday morning when there are so many competing activities. <clears throat> we knew that there's a sort of missing generational cohort in the 20s and 30s groups that we need to attract, but have not been a lot, have a lot of success doing that. And one of the things the pandemic did was just accelerate all of those trends. So we've seen that happen. What, what are the questions that this is gonna to pose to us? We're gonna have some real hard questions to answer about the financial viability of the received model we've been given about what is a parish. We can talk a little bit about that in the questions. So, okay, fourth, I said this, we were gonna hear more about inequality. So inequality is something that we saw very profoundly revealed to us in our church during COVID. The Economist ran an article about three months ago now, the headline of which was, Christi COVID makes Christianity a winner take all game. And what they were observing in that article was, Wealthy parishes with resources were installing cameras and installing microphones and putting stuff online for virtual worship that was beautiful and well-produced. And lots and lots of little churches, including most of ours here in, in Europe, you know, were faithfully doing everything that they possibly could with a couple of iPhones and maybe a laptop and just trying to get something out there in the world. And it's hard. So those inequalities, were, were really revealed to us. And think about this, another inequality that was really made clear to our country in this time was that communities of color and communities of underprivileged folks were disproportionately affected by this disease in two ways. First of all, they got sick more often and their sicknesses were much more severe. And secondly, they work on the front lines more often. They're the bus drivers and the garbage collectors and the, the folks who, who take care of the hospitals. They were right there on the front line, most often exposed to this terrible disease and really having trouble in, in dealing with it. And guess what? The churches that serve those people are often the poorest churches that we have in our diocese. So, this inequality was just compounding in so many ways. And I think a really important question, my, my writers thought that a really important question for us is how do we address this constructively as a whole church? The inequality and in access to resources that was just made so, so plain in this time. And here's the hard question. What responsibility do well-resourced communities and institutions have in helping poor and marginalized churches keep their communities tended and gathered? What responsibility do the rich churches have for the poor churches is kind of the short form of that question. Some of you will know Kelly Brown Douglas, who's the Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Yale. Um, this is a pretty, pretty blunt quote, but it's the truth. This is not about returning to a normal that allowed for increasing injustice. That is the normal that we came from. It was the normal that we think we're all longing for that created those inequalities. So we don't want to go back to that. But if we're not going to go back to that, well, then what's the different path we want to choose? That's the question. Okay. The last thing that emerged from my writers was the questions about leadership in our church, challenge and shame. Um, one thing that I certainly saw was that this moment taught us that a new kind of leader, a new kind of structure uh, for the church was being sort of held up to us as the way of the future. Um, I observed clergy flourish in this time if they were people who felt pretty adept with technology and people who got into the work of ministry because their passion was connecting people. I also saw folk who 
you know, got into ministry because their passion was being the center of a liturgy. And those folks really struggled during this time because all of a sudden the liturgy wasn't being gathered. The people weren't coming. It was something very different. So what this time really showed us was in order for us to respond in flexible, nimble, creative ways to the challenges the world hands us in responding to God's call and mission, maybe we need a different kind of leader in the church of the future. And maybe the structures that we have, the structures that have shaped our ordination processes, the structures that have shaped our seminaries and our preparation, our formation programs for ministry, the structures that sort of shape our finances and all of those things, maybe what we need now are, are different structures and different leaders. Here's a quote from Andy Doyle, who's the Bishop of Texas. God has a mission and God's mission has a church, but there is no guarantee that we are that church unless we're ready to listen and to change. So that's a kind of hard thing to hear, but one thing I'm pretty persuaded of is the COVID has taught us that the world is changing and not just because of pandemic, because of the way people communicate, the way they build communities, the way they experience what Ian Markham at Virginia talks about as a spiritually infused universe. And leadership is one of the most important ways that we have to answer God's call to minister to that world. So a question for bishops, a question for commit commissions and ministry, a question for the whole church is, what are the leaders we need for the future that we're being called into? So I said that um, there was a, some themes that I wish I had addressed in this book or that I wish I'd heard from, from the writers that wrote for me. And here's one of them that I can see on my, my horizon here in your church in Europe as we move into the future. And it's that um, we're living in a post-global America. We're headed into a moment when um, America's presence in the world is less than it used to be. And the question for me as a bishop here is, what is our mission as a church in Europe in a period of declining American globalism? When I first came to Europe as an undergraduate, there were 380,000 American troops in Germany. Today, there are fewer than 30,000, 10% of what was here before. That's not just a lot of people. It's a huge cultural impact. It's a thing that Joseph Nye called soft power. It's the cultural impact of our country, of our ideas, of the way that we think, the things that we value, the way that we solve problems. All of that had a huge impact on the world, especially here in Europe. And now there's this moment where it feels like America is retrenching behind its borders. What does that mean for the Episcopal Church where it exists outside the United States? Do you know that the Episcopal Church is in 16 countries outside the United States? So what about all the rest of us who are out here as America sort of goes back home? What does that future look like for us? What must we do now to assure the vitality of all of our congregations in view of fewer American and British expats coming to our part of the, of the church. And among the people who are coming, there are fewer folks there who are churched, fewer who have an experience of the church. That's gonna be a challenge for us. One of the things we know we're gonna to have to do in responding to that is to speak the languages. We're no longer little pockets of American expatriates. We haven't been for 30 years. Increasingly, Americans are a minority in all of our congregations here. So we're gonna to have to look more and more like the communities around us and that change is already beginning to happen. So those are the themes that emerged as this book came together. And if you've not seen it, this is what the cover of it looks like. And I'm just gonna stop there and maybe stop sharing my screen for a moment and see if there are any questions that have emerged as I've talked. I see lots of muted people. No, should we just carry on? 
Yeah, Kathy. I'm finding um, I'm digesting it all now. Okay. I haven't really quite come yet. It's like, wow, it, it's uh, that's what's happening for me right now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. All right. Let's carry on then. How's that? Okay. So you've been arranged through a highly scientific process run by Kathy and Jill and maybe others into breakout groups. And you're going to discover what those groups are. And we're going to do two different things in our breakout groups. Um, we're going to, I'm going to set to you a sort of question uh, or a way in which if we were revising this little book together now for the next year ahead of us, um, what are two questions that we might wanna make sure we, we got people to think about? Um, and so I'm gonna set questions to you and then I'm gonna ask you to go into your groups and talk about them. And you're gonna have a facilitator in your group who has access to what's known as a Google Doc and that's where you're gonna take notes of your meeting. Because when we get back, we're not gonna have time to sort of hear in from everybody on a Zoom call. We'll just, y'all will be here until midnight your time and you don't want that to happen. So you're just gonna take notes on a Google Doc. And when this is over, then you're gonna share those Google Docs all with each other. So you can all see what everybody's sort of input was. How's that? And I'm going to get to see it too. So we're going to just have our work and then we're going to come back and get the next question and go work on that one. So that's how this is going to go. So let me share my screen again. And I'm going to take you into the first question for breakouts. So here's our task, friends. Um, this little book I think poses some good questions uh, that we need to consider as we move into our post-COVID future. And there are some other questions that maybe, you know, we didn't see so clearly when we were writing this year and a half ago now. And here's one of them. I wonder how many of you have heard this. Yeah, is this familiar? Have you said this yourself? <laughs> Have, right? You have, haven't you? I'll bet you have. All right. But let's really think about that. Do we really want to go back to that normal? Here are some prompts that I'd like you to think about. What about normal church was getting in the way of the church God is calling us to be? What were we not seeing because of our love of normal that for other people wasn't so great and was kind of a challenge about the Episcopal Church, maybe? When we long for normal, what does that reveal about the God that we worship? When, when, when we're just longing for that return to something called normal, does that say something to us about our idea of God? Do you think God is that sort of comfortable, normal all the time? <laughs> or, or is God maybe a little more restless? And finally, who were the people who found a path to inclusion in virtual church? Why weren't they included in normal church? And what about them? as we leave this time and go back to whatever that future is gonna be. So there are the prompts for breakout session. And I'm gonna try if I can to also paste those in the chat so that you will have them uh, when you go away. There they are. Um, so we're gonna break down into breakout groups now and we're gonna do that for about 25 minutes, which will bring us back into this room at about exactly 7.30, okay? Yeah. Well, welcome back everybody. I hope you had good conversations. I'm looking forward to reading the comments in the Google Docs that you created. 
Um, but what I'd like to do now is move on to our second question. This is going to be the one that we end with today, and then we're going to come back into one last plenary group to, to just say farewell. So I'm going to share my screen one more time, and you're going to see step four in our rewriting of this little book. What I want us to think about now is sort of to carry on from the work we just did and the conversation we just had. Um, we all remember about normal church and then we had COVID church, but now what we're gonna have is a new church. We're not just gonna go back to the old normal, we're gonna go forward to some sort of new church. We know that is true. We can't really avoid it. So here are the prompts for you to think about in this conversation. Let's, let's conduct a thought experiment together. Let's imagine that with all of the experience of the past 18 months that we've had, we could totally reinvent the Episcopal Church in response to God's call to us and not just living out our needs. I need the hymnal 1982 and I especially need hymn 675 because I love it dearly. And I need there to be um, vestments on the acolytes. And I need, you know, what are you, there are things that we need that we really kind of organize our lives and efforts around. But what if we could completely reinvent this based on some of the things that we've learned how to do in the last 18 months that we've learned about ourselves, that we've learned about the world around us that's yearning for connection to God and to a spiritual sense of meaning. So if we did that, what do we keep about what we have? What is it about what we have that actually helps us to respond to God's mission today? What would we let go of? And what would we expect to change? In other words, what would change in the world because of the way that we changed our church? So that's a pretty big order. And I'm gonna copy those questions in the chat again here so that people have access to them when they go into the breakout rooms. But just to give you a sense of some prompts here. Here are some things that you might mention as you talk about things you'd want to hold on to or things you'd be willing to let go of. You might mention structures like dioceses or deaneries, provinces, or general convention. Um, Didi and I work together, Bishop Didi and I work together on province too. And sometimes we spend our time in meetings of province to talking about why do we have provinces? <laughs> That's an interesting question. And it's, a, it's an important question because people ought not to have, we ought not to have structures in the church that exist for the, for the purpose of being structures. That's, that's, there's no New Testament authority for simply complexifying the life of the church. So think about, you know, what, what are the structures that we have that work? that help us to respond to God's call and mission? And the one, what are the ones that get in the way? What about offices and orders? And by orders, I mean orders of ministry. We have inherited the historic threefold ordained ministry, deacon, priest, and bishop. Um, we have offices like the president of province two, Bishop Didi, or the bishop in charge in the convocation, that's my job. Um, are, there, are they fit for purpose or are there things that we would do differently? What about economic models and expectations? Um, Bishop Didi kindly mentioned a book that I'd written earlier about bivocational ministry. One of the things I learned in writing that book is that, you know, we've inherited an idea about what is the economic model of a parish. And in general, that idea that we inherited was a parish is an economic entity that it can afford to pay a full-time benefited professional called a priest. And if you can't do that, then there's a question mark over whether you're a viable church. Well, I don't think that's true. I think there are lots of viable ministries out there that may not have the, the resources to afford a full-time member of the clergy, but do great ministry. So 
are there models that we have inherited that we just think are the way God always meant things to be that we need to think about again? What about traditions and customs or comforts that we have? Some of those help strengthen us and that helps respond to God's mission for sure. But are there some that are getting in the way or that we're keeping folk out who weren't coming in before, who could come in when we open the doors and windows to virtual church? And finally, this is a kind of funny one, but what about the names that we give ourselves? I once went to an annual meeting of a parish that I was the rector of. It was a place called St. John's. And in the annual meeting, I had us do a funny exercise. And it was simply this. I came to them with a little fake news story that said a Vatican investigation had shown that St. John, the saint that we were named for, had used performance enhancing substances during his life as a saint. And therefore he was being stricken from the record and we were gonna to have to name our church after somebody else or after something else. And what would we name our church if we had to do it again? That was the most interesting conversation because we started talking about the things that were actually descriptive of who we were and what we loved in that place that we would want people to know about us in our name and you know think about that we're all we're all named for saints or we're named for seasons or for events or or for ideas in the church but do those really connect with the people around us that is that a language that they still speak mm. so there are some prompts the question again is this is a thought experiment let's just imagine that we can reinvent anything anything to make our church better respond to God's call and mission to us. And, and think about central New York, think about your community, your parish, but also your region. What would you change and what would you keep and how would you put those new things together? Okay, that's the word. Let's do, we'll do this for 25 minutes, I should say, and we'll come back at about exactly eight o'clock. How's that? Okay, we'll make it five minutes before eight, just so we have a little time to say good night. All right. Well, I hope that was an interesting conversation for people to have. And I'm really looking forward to reading the comments that the facilitators typed up in their Google Docs. And then I hope that will be shared with all of you so you can all sort of see what everybody else had to say. Um, so I've really just got. Uh, one more thing to say here, and that is uh, whoop, simply this. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, being a part of this with me. Uh, I really appreciate you making time to be in this conversation, and most of all, to be in this conversation with each other. Um, you know, do think about ways that you can take these questions that you've worked on in your groups tonight um, into your own community into your own church and in, into the communities that you're part of, but especially your parish. Um, you know, what about our normal church wasn't working for everybody? Think about the people who are suddenly with us that weren't before because they could come on Zoom and wow, it's great to have them. How are we gonna make sure we keep ministering to them? And that question about how might we reinvent our church and the whole church, um, not just our church at you know Grace Church or wherever, um, but our whole Episcopal church, um, you know, that those are, we are a self-governing church. This is our church um, and it's, it's right for all of us to have a voice in those questions. So thanks for being part of this with me. I really appreciate it. And uh, when you can come and visit your church in Europe, here we are, we're yours, your sisters and brothers. So, you know, check us out. Mark, thank you so much for your time and being with us and facilitate this conversation. We're looking forward to uh, the direction it does go um, and in our diocese. And so also uh, look forward to the next time uh, to come out and visit your churches. Absolutely. Um, so looking forward to that. And uh, let's, I'm going to say a quick prayer and then we'll depart. So the Lord be with you. And also with Lord. You. Those things we have discussed and held in our heart, things said and unsaid, we hold before you. May your spirit move in us, empower us and guide us as we move forward your new church 
transformed by your presence and love and always in this evolving way that you're moving through us, ministering through us and empowering us. Give us ears, Lord, to hear you, eyes to see and hearts attuned to your love. In your name we pray, amen. Blessings to you all. Mark, Blessings thank you so much. See you soon. All Blessings. right, peace everybody. Good night from Paris.